My name is Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Altenhörner Dion. I work with the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe has been active in the field of internet governance really since the very beginning with a number uh, of legally binding conventions, the Cyber Crime Convention, but also the Budapest Convention on, um, with respect to the rights of individuals uh, towards uh, automatic processing, which is of course important, and that's from 81 and has over 60 member states. So we are trying to work always also with the kind of global sphere in mind. And we are now working on standard setting in a number of areas, but also in the area of algorithms and artificial intelligence. And my name is Nicholas Souza. I'm an associate professor at uh, Queensland University of Technology School of Law, um, where we head up the Digital Media Research Centre, where we study, it's an interdisciplinary uh, research centre where we study the governance of the internet. So thank you all again for joining us this morning. Yes, so thank you. And what's going to happen is that I'll give you a super short introduction, just the framing of this session, a uh, little bit content-wise, and then I'll hand it over to Nicolas, who will uh, tackle the challenging <laughs> test to explain how we would like to achieve what, the, what we are going to discuss here. So, as you know, the title of the session is uh, AI will sol solve all problems, but can it? And um, when we first started thinking about it, we were already, of course, very much aware of the presence mm -hmm of uh, illegal and harmful content online and ongoing uh, private and public initiatives to try to tackle these issues, uh, which are based on many, many different societal problems manifesting from child pornography and exploitation through disinformation online until hate speech. And a couple of months ago when we submitted this session, we were referring to Mark Zuckerberg's testimonies before uh, the US Congress talking about how AI will be the solution for all of our problems. So that was approximately six months ago and then today we are already in a partnership between France and Facebook uh, announced today to experiment how Facebook tackles online hate speech and how it will inform how France will try to regulate hate speech. And we have a little bit of understanding that now, as we heard President Macron's speech yesterday, which opened the door a little bit of an intermediary liability conversation, a lot of content moderation, and even some platform neutrality questions, which I think triggered a lot of conversations and we are very happy that it informs this session this morning. So, um, as a Brussels-based NGO, I see all these initiatives turning into legislative proposals quite quickly. To name one, the European Commission is working on a, on a regulation to tackle terrorist content online. And uh, on the other side of the equation, many member states are working on artificial intelligence-related strategies and proposals. And uh, yeah, I, I have to uh, advertise a little bit that we just did a report that's available here in hard copies, but also online. We did a human rights uh, comparison of all the publicly available member state strategies on artificial intelligence and also some regional bodies. So that's the framing content-wise. The question here, what we would like to achieve, is how artificial intelligence and similar technologies can or cannot solve content moderation problems in a human rights respecting manner. And then I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. Um, so first I want to uh, again echo Jan's um, welcome and, and uh, gratitude for all of you for coming not only first thing on, um, on Tuesday morning, but particularly for your willingness, whether you know it or not, to participate in a, in a session that is a little bit different. Um, one of the things that really struck us was um, a frustration with panels where we only really get the perspective of a few pre-selected uh, people at the front. And that's a real shame given the amount of expertise in the room about these topics. So what we'd like to do today is focus on the end result. We want to be able to produce from this session a crowdsourced level of confidence that AI can address um, the three particular content issues that we're going to be talking about um, 
in a way that respects human rights. So in order to do that, we really are um, uh, imploring and, and begging of you for your active participation. We're, we're working a little bit against the architecture of the room, which is not um, well set up for a group, for small group discussions. But the basic plan, and I'm, I'm again asking for your patience and uh, maybe your innovation here, is we're going to divide up into three separate groups. One group on hate speech, one group on extremist content, and one group on disinformation. Within each one of those groups, we would like to spend half an hour to 40, 40 minutes um, essentially coming up with a list of the pros and cons of uh, why we think AI may or may not be able to address some of these content issues. Now, what I want to really stress here is we want to use the expertise in the room to develop not just a, a single answer but a more nuanced picture of the sorts of things that um, machine learning and other technologies are likely to be useful for and the sorts of risks that they propose. So I am going to ask you to also within your groups um, not just to focus on, for example, the, the cons on a particular issue. We want to provide um, in a very abridged debate format a two-minute report on the um, pros that you've come up with in your 30 minutes and a two minute report on the negative or the threats that you've come up with in that particular domain. And so even if we have to play devil's advocate a little bit, we really want to try to capture, and we'll be recording this um, and, and documenting this, the, the breadth of the concerns that we can then present back to the group and we will then have a, a voting session where which we um, will also then capture the results of that voting session to identify the spread of confidence that we have in these three particular domains. We think that this is likely to be um, quite a useful outcome, better than uh, just a normal report from, from a panel session, but a reflection of right now, the sense in the room, how likely we are to be able to respond to the challenges that we heard in the keynote address last night uh, with the current state of AI technologies. And hopefully that will be able to better inform a more nuanced policy debate. Um, so having said that, it's now, it's now 10 past nine. We're gonna break into three groups, starting off um, on the left here with hate speech. Um, yes. <laughs> I guess on the left hand side, my left, um, on, on this far wall, uh, more towards the back on disinformation. And over here with this particular group, uh, Carly, you want to throw up your hands, uh, over there with, uh, what have I left out? Um, yeah. Extremist Terrorist content. Terrorist, Terrorist and extremist, extremist content. content. Yeah. So again, thank you for your forbearance. Thank you for your participation. And let's try to see whether we can come up with a, with a good list and a good output. Um, they have, they have oh, yes. You are allowed to switch. Yeah, please, I mean, please get up and move. Wait, wait, but sorry, one more, <laughs> one more point before, because I've just, uh, Thanny's just reminded me. Out of this, we'd like you to pick uh, two rapporteurs, one for the pros, one for the cons, uh, in your groups that is able then to report back to the entire group um, in two minutes each, very quickly. What are we doing here? Um, uh, it's hate speech. Should I walk over to a hate speech first? Yeah. Or, or yeah. This information yeah. Yes, I'll tell you. What are you doing? This oh, information. Oh, you, whatever you. Yeah. 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 Where, where's this information? Where is the this is information. Yeah. Information. Yeah. 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 That's hate speech. I'm gonna go to the terrorist content because I cannot cannot leave it on it.
I. Tamam şu.
Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Very good. So we are going to actually, because of the room and because of the noise level, we will try to please have all rapporteurs speak into a microphone. This is also good for note taking. And uh, we are going to start with the hate speech group, go then to the disinformation group and then come to extremist content. You will have about two minutes for the pro argument and two minutes for the con argument. And we would then like to open the floor quickly for a brief about five minute question and answer session to the group. And then we will go to the next group. The plan is to have about 30 minutes of this. Okay, great. So I will gladly hand then to the one of the two reporters from the hate speech group. Hello, my name is Lionel. So I'm going to um, number the uh, negative issues and uh, which are basically six key points um, oh sorry the positive machines will identify <laughs> because I have all of them here <laughs> the positive is only one <laughs> machines will identify hate speech faster um, and on a much larger scale than human based moderation AI can help identify content related to hateful speech. Assessment is much more complex. AI can help moderators to filter content. 
Then civil society can provide input in terms of how to characterize hate speech. Bots can be used to train young people or educate young people around the risks of hate speech. And this one, which is very problematic, bots can help to reduce the number of people needed to detect hateful speech, perhaps good for companies, but also can potentially lead to higher levels of unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> so the pros? So um, I'm Anri. I'm the negatives, which were slightly more um, focused around the three the different phases um, that we sort of identified in the process. And the first one, as we mentioned, was around just identifying what is potential hate speech, and that was where the one pro came in. Um, and then the two layers that follow that was assessing or flagging whether something is potentially amounts to hate speech. And we said to some extent that could be done by, by algorithms, but um, we should have some human involvement until the machines become better at, nat um, at language processing. So that's a, a maybe negative. Um, and then we said that there would probably always be a need for human involvement in the right to review um, and reviewing that second phase um, in that process. Um, and, and this also evolves because the definition of hate speech um, evolves and we see that with courts at the moment and the same with AI will probably need to evolve. And we had a broader philosophical question about whether, um, whether humans will actually be able to do this proportionality test better than machines. Um, uh, we talked about in terms of another negative was um, whether platforms will start adopting stricter liability thresholds when there's a, a bigger sort of tech clash around these issues um, and how we compare these sorts of questions around thresholds with um, the balancing exercise um, and whether machines are able to actually manage the sort of proportionality test, um, whether humans can do that better, um, and then again humans um, being exposed to the kind of content which they are exposed to when they have to evaluate um, that content. We had a broader philosophical question around transparency from companies and why we are not holding them more accountable to, um, to saying how these things work. Um, and then a constructive recommendation towards the end around the need for involving more civil society or just broader sort of stakeholder involvement in defining hate speech and designing these things. Um, and something that I mentioned, forgot to mention at the beginning was the importance of taking a step back and just looking at the starting point. Um, and how different processes are very different levels when it comes to using AI for identifying, identifying hate speech. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Anybody else from the group who would like to add something? Yeah? I'm not sure if she mentioned it. The last point I raised is that after it's been flagged by a human or something like that, AI might be able to actually build up case files of perpetrators to, to build a file so that law enforcement uh, uh, liability can come, is more, f more follow up on liability issues. So, enforcement uh, benefits uh, of AI. Anybody, any question to the group? Anything that was maybe not considered in your view? Uh, yes, Michael. I, I couldn't hear anything about, uh, let me phrase it, cultural dependent algorithm because. What is hate speech in one country may not be hate speech in, in another part of the world. Yes, yeah, so I think that was what we try to, I might have just skipped over it, but talk about in terms of the definition of hate speech and how at the moment even courts are keep, keep on evolving their understanding of hate speech. And I think as part of that, yes, it depends on the region and the sort of language and, and um, how even humans at the moment aren't able to identify that within one country, so how Anybody else? Yes, please. I really would hate to leave uh, this particular group without a better understanding of what the, how the group defined hate speech. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I, I'm, I'm really puzzling because um, even though I come from the United States where we have a robust freedom of expression, uh, freedom of speech, uh, I still personally am very conservative. And 
I think I would know hate speech if I saw it, but I don't know how that would be generally defined within my country or within the world. Um, so I'd appreciate some helpful hints. So I think it's a terrific question. We felt it was somewhat outside of our remit. Um, and that if, uh, though our group is, uh, was terrific and august and, and the discussion was vibrant, um, if we had been able to answer that question in 30 <laughs> minutes, um, we uh, would have been a, a terrific group indeed. I, we did um, get at some, I think, of the balancing questions around how we answer that, um, to your point, it's a question that we actually can't answer at the um, global level. It has to be answered um, within uh, particular communities. Um, so it's not, it's not quite possible to say what is hate speech um, internationally. Um, also, the definition that we arrive at balances a number of human rights. It balances um, the rights of freedom of expression and access to information against um, the rights to privacy, human dignity, and non-discrimination. So um, we want to achieve an information environment where people are able to access the content they want um, without it being buried in a sort of sea of filth. Um, but we also want to allow, you know, to have a preference for the content that people are putting out there um, to be available without being over censored by the platforms. So it's not really an answer from a content perspective, but more um, the sort of concerns that we had identified around how that definition should be drawn. Um, and we did note, and this came up I think from both our presenters, um, that there are interesting opportunities for um, companies and platforms to involve civil society groups at the uh, local and regional and uh, national and international levels um, in arriving at and revising those definitions. Thank you. More jurisdiction. Usually one very important parameter is actually looking at the victim, the victim's point of view. That's usually where you have to start to look at hate speech and then you have different other parameters. But you have to focus on the victim's, you know, the victim's subjective side. Uh, and that can be difficult if it's not a person, of course. It could be a whole community. But, but that's, that might be a good starting point. Thank you. I think that about closes it for this group. Of, ah. um, yeah, so I think this, this idea is a bit crazy. But uh, what I was thinking is uh, if you have classifiers and models that can uh, classify groups with high prediction accuracy, and it's, uh, it's very clear that when you have the data and you can cut it into uh, groups of people with different opinions, then you are more, uh, you have high tendency or you are more susceptible to uh, hate speech. So when you, the more the data is fragmented and away from each other and you have clear clusters, the more you have uh, uh, sensitivity to hate speech. So this is one of the ideas I was just thinking about. Thank you, and I'm going to abuse for a moment my role as moderator and uh, mention the courts, which have not been mentioned at all, and of course in the identification of illegal content. Uh, what is in most European uh, legislative frameworks crucial is whether there is an incitement um, element to speech, whether we are actually inciting people to a crime, and that of course is an important uh, element to uh, determine whether this is content that deserves to be taken down, that should be identified as illegal or not. Um, but thank you very, very much to this group. Uh, fantastic. And we are coming to disinformation, and uh, you take your pick in terms of the order of Robert speaking. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Tomislav and I will be reporting on the negative aspects of AI deciding what is misinformation and what not. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Um, so, uh, basically, AI cannot judge context was the first thing we came up with and uh, cultural or otherwise, so an ironic or satiric article might quickly be labeled as misinformation even though it is not. 
languages are still a huge barrier for AI, so cross-referencing uh, articles in different languages uh, would quickly be impossible because AI is still not very good at translating from one language to the other. Uh, also, a big problem is that AI cannot self-reflect, so if it finds uh, uh, something that it considers to be misinformation, it cannot uh, fix that mistake. Uh, also, AI will probably label new ideas as misinformation. It uses past data to learn, so new uh, ideas, new ways of thinking would be uh, something it's not familiar with. And uh, in its essence, truth is very subjective and unstable. Everybody has their own truth, and AI cannot account for that. Uh, the last uh, point raised was uh, de-anonymization, uh, group profiling and privacy, uh, data clustering people, um, because there's, that's about it. If anybody would like to add from my group, uh, this last point was not, uh, I didn't quite get the gist of it completely. The point I made was in the uh, field of education, so AI has also the potential, the bad potential, to cluster children by, I think, profiling is the correct word in, when we are talking adults. But when we are talking children, I think the high risk is of clustering children. And by that, the ultimate risk will be uh, uh, predetermining their lives, in a way. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, on uh, de-anonymization, we were uh, talking about, just as an example, if you uh, remove the person who quoted uh, a quote and uh, just stated his words, it's easy to know who this person is. So uh, we thought about uh, standardizing the data uh, in terms of like powerful speech or in terms of like uh, um, what, it, what issue it addresses. Cool. So uh, we were looking at the, uh, the positives, and I have uh, two or three points that we want to go through. Um, and the first one, I think it's sort of the most important point, is what is the alternatives? Um, so we are, we're entering into a time in history where there's going to be too much information to be dealt with with humans. Like, there's no way that we could have enough humans sitting behind the computers verifying. So there is basically no alternatives. It's something that we're going to have to embrace um, in terms of disinformation. Um, we sort of took the view in our group that humans will come into play, though. Uh, we're not going to ever have a system that's completely AI, that AI is just going to be making the call and removing content, um, that humans should and will always be part of this uh, loop. Um, so uh, the, the second point that we had is that AI provides a lot of things that humans can't. So the, the breadth, the depth, and the speed. Um, so. Just the amount of data, um, we were talking about YouTube and uh, how many like hours and hours of video would have to be watched. It's just not possible for humans to be able to watch that amount of video. Um, but I think also um, a point that was really interesting in our group was the depth. Um, so looking at not just the content of the article, but where it's coming from, who it was published by, you know, what is the point, what is the context that it's being published in, that's not something that a, a a human sitting behind a computer who doesn't have context on that issue would be able to really see if they have, you know, 10 seconds to say if this is misinformation or not. Um, that, but AI could. It could let, look into the depth of the uh, article. And then the last one was speed, of course, because in all of these things of disinformation, um, getting it down fast makes such a big difference because how many views, how many shares it gets. I mean, uh, with disinformation, you can try to counter it after the fact, but most of the time this has been proved to be not effective at all. You have to get it down fast enough that it's not seen and shared. Um, and getting back to this, um, this idea of depth, um, something that AI could do um, is uh, find out who is sharing this, um, who are the retreats coming from, who are the botnets that are supporting this. And if you can find the depth of the article, then you can find the networks and the actual origins uh, of the disinformation, which would be very important because, uh, as we were talking about in our group, a lot of the misinformation is shared like on 
our Facebook feeds, it's shared by people who we know. Um, these are our friends. These are not people who are purposely trying to share misinformation or disinformation. Um, they're just people who thought it was funny, that the meme was funny or something like this. Um, so using AI to come back to the origins of these stories and take down the people who are creating the content um, and not punishing the people who are just simply sharing it. Um, and then the final point we sort of came to was that um, AI might not need to even delete information. Um, one of the big things with social media now is the sorting algorithms um, and what you see first on your feed. So is this the most um, emotionally charged content that's going to get the most likes and the most um, retweets, or is this the most credible content? Um, and if we're looking at AI as a future gatekeeper, it could be something that would promote content that is more credible and find sources um, and people who are, have uh, higher trustworthiness and promote that content higher on the, the feeds instead of the content that is the most likable. Great. Any question from the broader group or point? You have to do. I, I thought your point about not just looking at the content, but looking where it comes from, looking at the track record of the people posting was incredibly important. Did you have any specific cases where that was being done? Any examples we can point to and say, yeah, that's working? So uh, I don't have so much background in AI, but uh, in disinformation, um, I know this is what's being done by humans right now. Um, and if we take the same processes that are being done by human right now um, and use AI to scale them, then it could be a, a possible solution. So I know in the recent, um, the recent case where they were taking down uh, Twitter accounts from Saudi Arabia, um, this was looking at not just because they were posting some political content, some non-political content, um, but only by looking through their track record were they able to say that these are, these are false accounts. Thank you. I just had a brief question, a follow-up uh, on the really interesting point about curation and um, as opposed to deletion, the, the promotion of, um, of counter-speech or the demotion of perhaps less trustworthy speech. And I'm wondering whether you um, got around to discussing at all how these systems are exploited by really quite sophisticated um, actors who are trying to spread disinformation. So I'm thinking particularly of um, one of the recent reports from uh, Data and Society that, that shows that um, algorithms that we that we built to sort content that um, were not are not really resilient enough to tackle systemic exploitation um, by people who are really keen on spreading disinformation and and hate. And I'm wondering whether you you, you talked at all about that other side of those um, content curation and, and promotion algorithms. No, not necessarily, but I think it's, it's, an, it's not uh, like you reach a, a static end in terms of the evolution of your algorithm. It's, it's a continual arms race, and you're going to have to evolve it and make it better. Great. If there's no one else, we are going to come to the last group, please. Thank you very much to this group. Um, all right, so our group was on extremist content. Um, we, di we didn't do the best job at filling, fulfilling our brief in terms of a list of pros and cons, but we, we had a good, uh, robust discussion around some of the issues with extremist content, which I think lend itself to the challenges of AI in dealing with this. Um, and in many ways, we had very similar uh, issues and challenges as the hate speech group. So um, one of the core ones is, is kind of definitional. Once you get away from the really worst cases of extremist content, so we, we talked a bit about things like beheading videos. Um, what is extremist content um, and whether the degree of violence or that it causes harm to somebody or that it um, goes against the values of a particular country, AI would have challenges in identifying the degree of, of what we would classify as extremist content um, and, I, and where that bleeds into hate speech and even disinformation. 
Um, and we also talked about some of the jurisdictional issues that that brings up. So not only are the, are the laws of each country different, but the, the policy and philosophical concerns of each country are very different. Um, and there, there's that bit of a sort of, I guess, EU-US divide sometimes around what ought to stay up and what ought to to come down. So um, again, with the beheading videos, so there are there was some, there would be some people of the view that um, where content uh, helps to inform people about things, then that should stay up in some circumstances and there would be other people who would think that that would, should come down in every circumstance. Um, and so it would be very difficult. The AI tends to lend itself to sort of hardline programming and not so much of that, that nuance. Um, and we also had concerns around transparency and where, these, where the AI and algorithms sit within companies um, and, and who is making the decisions about what, what stays up and what comes down. Uh, I'm Mike Nelson. Uh, I work for Cloudflare, which is an internet security firm, and we protect about 12 million websites from DDoS attacks. Um, and some of our customers are pretty strange and extreme people. Um, you may have heard about the case with the Daily Stormer, which is the one case in our history where we actually terminated a customer for their speech, although Truth be told, we also terminated them because they were doing something that looked like libel and fraud and, and other things. But in general, we don't want the hackers and the people launching DDoS attacks to be deciding what speech is allowed online. So we do protect a lot of different uh, players. So I'm very glad to be part of this discussion. We had a very multi-stakeholder group. We had industry, government, a lot of academics, international organizations. The one thing we were missing is we did not have any Asian representation. And looking around the room, I don't think we have covering that very well. Um, I should also say our group only had two Americans, so the First Amendment didn't get all that much attention. Um, but I did choose, pick this group. I agree, it's good not to have American voices drowning out everybody else. <laughs> um, but I picked this group because I thought it was going to be a lot easier than the other two groups. Uh, it wasn't. Um, and, and, the, and the reason uh, I, I think we're going to have problems here just relying on artificial intelligence as the magic solution uh, have been mentioned. Uh, it's almost impossible to figure out the intent of the person posting it. Uh, three years ago, we got attacked mercilessly by a group in the UK that decided that we were fostering jihadists, and they told all of our customers Look, look at this website, it's terrible. It's got these, this celebration of jihadist attacks. It turned out it was a Kurdish website. It wasn't in Arabic, it was in Kurdish, and it was showing the atrocities against the Kurdish people. It was exactly the opposite of what these people thought it was. Uh, likewise, um, several of you have mentioned the difficulty of deciding what's legal and what's not legal, and how it varies from place to place, we run a global network. The whole, th whole reason we have our network is to provide content to everyone. So it gets very hard for people trying to do that to subdivide the internet. The other point though, I think, and the reason I think artificial intelligence, machine learning in particular has a role to play, is what you said. We don't have to just look at the content and try to decide what's good and what's bad, what's allowed, what's not, we can try to identify who's behind these sources. And so I mentioned in our discussion a wonderful site, which everybody should write down, makeadverbsgreatagain.com. It's, it's, it's even simpler than the Google interface. You just type in the handle of the Twitter account that you think might be a troll and it gives you a rating from 0 to 10 on the likelihood that its behavior indicates that it's a troll. The reason I think that's a good example to share is because it's not about having the websites and the on uh, online service providers decide 
it's about each of us getting informed about what we're seeing and dismissing the stuff that we don't want to see. And in the future, I think it's going to be on the content companies online to help give individuals better tools that allow them to make their own rules. Um, we do that at the network layer. We allow our customers to figure out what countries they don't want to see traffic from if they've been getting lots of attacks or lots of malware from particular uh, countries. But I think the, the, the thing that came out in our discussion, and this is probably the most important conclusion, was it's not whether AI can do magic or not. It's whether we ask AI, crowdsourcing, little data, other tools to do the right thing. And I think there was a lot of concern that we've been asking the technology to do impossible things. So let's design the system properly. Let's have lawmakers who understand what can and cannot be done and, and not believe that there's one technology that's going to be our magic bullet. So thank you very much. Uh, we had a great discussion. And if you want to get the full list of case studies, we'll put that together in a summary. And because uh, we had, we spent about half of our time just talking about case studies as a way to illuminate this issue. Thank you very much. And we have one question right here. Thank you very much for mentioning intent, because um, it made me think about this uh, proposal of the there is content regulation in the EU, and it might be an interesting uh, notion that uh, they left out the word intent uh, from the proposal as opposed to what's in the terrorism directive. And of course, uh, everyone reads the text because of the lack of intent as an encouragement to use uh, automated content monitoring tools uh, for detecting that content. And I haven't heard from any of the groups this um, concern very specifically addressed in the privacy area. And we know that some of the companies are already doing this for child exploitation, for instance. And I'm wondering if this came up in any of your discussions, because I heard it here, but not too much elsewhere. Well, as I said in our, in our discussion, there were several times when people said, hey, you know, it does matter why it's there. Uh, you know, our, our, our motto in the States is the solution to bad speech is more good speech. And often that requires showing the bad speech and then debunking it. Um, the other problem, of course, is if the AI cleans up all the bad speech, the people doing that bad speech will then go out to their followers and say, look, what we're saying is so dangerous that Google and the American government and the EU, they're all suppressing us. And that is a very powerful way to build your cult. So I, I think that's, but thank you for mentioning that. The other thing I, I did not mention, and we should have done this at the start, uh, we did about three or four polls. You know, thumbs up, AI's working, thumbs down, it's not, sideways. Time after time, our polls came out. One quarter up, one quarter down, one quarter sideways, and one quarter confused. <laughs> and that was, I think, where we are in this debate. Okay, thank you. Before we come to our group, thumbs up or down, uh, are there any other questions, maybe one more question to this group from the plenary? Sorry, you have a question to another group? Yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, the point is now for someone to ask a question to you. Yes, please. Well, this is probably a question to the first group that reported out. May I, may I ask the question? I'm sitting here puzzling over cyberbullying, and but I'm, I'm thinking about it in a particular context. Um, in the United States, we've had situations where young people have committed suicide because of the bullying on social media. 
and their parents may go to the other parents and say, stop it. If indeed, if indeed the child even speaks up to say anything, or you go to a school system who's recalcitrant to get involved, and then court suits only occur after the poor child has committed suicide, and, and the courts are really struggling with this. Is there any role for technology in cyberbullying, or is this a situation where it's just one off and the, the victim has to deal with it or not? Uh, I, I don't know. But I mean it sincerely as a question to this entire group. Just to, to, if I understood your question, I think it's about, if I understood it correctly, it's also about responsibility. We have to be more transparent in actually who has the, the, the responsibility for what. I mean, sometimes we, it might not be enough to, uh, to, to remedy bad speech with more good speech. Perhaps we should have a more transparent regulation as to where the legal responsibility should be placed. And that's a bit unclear perhaps today. We have to be clearer with, with, that, with, with who is in charge and who is responsible. And the machines will perhaps not be able to do that. That's still the accountability that does rest with the persons in charge of the system that might generate the hate speech, for instance, as an example. Anyone who wants to add? Thank you. Oh. Um, just a quick point, I haven't really thought about this at all. I could imagine that um, there's probably fairly familiar patterns of behaviour in terms of cyberbullying that a, a machine might help to detect, especially for the children who don't speak up. So there might be potential there to harness um, some pattern recognition tools that will help to identify it. I think when you're talking particularly about minors, I think it is important to remember that actually the state has... Uh, a more uh, a sort of benevolent capacity to protect children because they are not fully autonomous and so there there is a stronger case for state intervention in those kinds of situations because minors cannot protect themselves so I, I simply raise that as, as something to think about in terms of governance thank you and sorry I'm afraid we have to stop this now cyberbullying was of, it's also a specific form of crime really so we didn't uh, it's difficult to group that with hate speech I think uh, uh, we are now handing to Jan for our general vote yeah um, you've already all um, been very flexible today but you're not off the hook yet so um, you said some th thumbs up thumbs down maybe confused um, we actually want you to do that right now as well um, as a vote of confidence we, in AI's abilities to solve all problems, uh, we would like you to um, engage in one final form of gymnastics in here. You don't have to get up on your tables, but we want to do the following. We want to ask you, do you think AI can solve, um, what, did we start with hate speech, um, and be respectful of um, human rights at the same time? Uh, we want to ask the same thing about um, disinformation, and we want to ask the same thing about uh, extremist content. So, if you... Is this 2018 or is this 2035? Immediate future. Immediate future to... Yeah. Let's say years. Yes. Um, can it help? Can it, can it help while respecting fundamental rights? Yes. Ranks? So, what we want you to do is line up against the walls. Your confidence at 0% being in that corner your confidence being at 100% in that corner, along this wall. <laughs> we will take a photo, we will not share it, it's just for internal reporting purposes. Um, can AI solve hate speech? Please. Can we just help solve, help, help. Can we, can we, can we, can we, can we, can we make it a little more precise and say, how much of the problem do you think you can solve? So yeah, I think I you can solve a third, I'll sit here. If I think you can solve a hundred, I'll stand over there. Yes, yes so I think that's, 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 yeah, that's right. And so, if you can solve nothing, you're over there. So solve is in the back left corner over here, 100 percent. 100 percent fail or um, fail to help at all thank you, is thank you. It's, it's an experiment. It's an experiment. It'll, it should be interesting. And please don't use this as an opportunity to escape. We really do need. To... <laughs> <laughs> your vote of confidence. But
to confuse people, I have to sit in front of the front runner.